All right, good afternoon. My name is Brent Helwig. I'm a member of the faculty at Washington and Lee School of Law, and I also serve as the school's dean. And it gives me great pleasure today to welcome you to the Washington and Lee University Institute of Honor Symposium, which this year is dedicated to examining the European refugee crisis from a moral perspective. The Institute of Honor, established through a generous gift from the undergraduate class of 1960, supports programming designed to promote the understanding and practice of honor as an indispensable element of society. In connection with the establishment of the Institute, the class of 1960 also endowed a chaired professorship to guide the Institute's programming. That professorship is currently held by one of my colleagues on the law faculty, Samuel Calhoun, who serves as the class of 1960 professor of ethics and law. So I will now turn the floor over to Professor Calhoun, who will introduce the, uh, the symposium topic, as well as our distinguished um, speaker this afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to join Dean Helwig in welcoming all of you to the Institute for Honor Symposium on the European Refugee Crisis, the Search for a Moral so response. Uh, the importance of this topic is hard to overstate. For the past year or so, there's been a virtually unending succession of disturbing uh, photos and news reports about the refugee crisis. We all remember in se September 2005 when the photo of Alan Kurdi, the two-year-old Syrian boy, drowned, uh, circled the world, shocked the world, uh, and put a human face on the crisis. Uh, then in August 2016, we had another photo of a child, a five-year-old uh, boy, Amran Dagnish, taken after he was pulled from bombing rubble in Aleppo. And he instantly became the, the worldwide face of the five-year civil war, which has taken, uh, said, of roughly 500,000 lives in Syria. And uh, late last month, uh, the United Nations High Com the Commissioner for Refugees reported that so far this year 3,800 people had drowned in the Mediterranean, which is the highest so far uh, of any year. Uh, and you may have seen news reports that yesterday uh, two boats capsized just off of Libya and it said that uh, about 240 people drowned. Uh, CNN uh, commenting on the report of 3,800 drownings had this to say, rickety boats that should never have sailed, unscrupulous smugglers with no regard for life, and desperate people risking everything. That mix of fear, hope, and greed has now produced a horrifying record. This symposium is actually the third prong of university-wide emphasis on the refugee crisis. Uh, the Center for International Education has just started a two-year faculty colloquium entitled Borders and Their Human Impact. Uh, their concept of borders is wide. Uh, they look at it from a variety of perspectives, but one of them involves the creation and crossing of geopolitical boundaries. In addition, this semester there's a course at the university that includes both undergrad and law students called German Law in Context, and it is focusing exclusively on the European refugee crisis. And the seminar has produced a rich array of programming all semester, uh, including an October address by Oxford professor David Miller, who's the author of the 2016 influential book, Strangers in Our Midst. So the Institute for Honor is the third prong of this uh, emphasis. And our goal in this symposium today and tomorrow is to further stimulate thought on how best to seek a humane, responsible, and realistic response to this ongoing human tragedy. Well, some of you may wonder what connection the Institute for Honor has to the European refugee crisis. As Dean Helwig said, the Institute for Honor was established in 2000 pursuant to a generous endowment from the undergraduate class of 1960. And the Institute's stated purpose is to disseminate the values of the Washington and Lee Honor System. And these values are broader than the core function of a student honor code, 
preventing lying, cheating, stealing. Uh, if you look at the website for WNL's honor system, it speaks of the ideals of honor, civility, and integrity. And I quote from our website, honor pervades every aspect of life deepening relationships and allowing uncommon intellectual freedom. Civility and integrity create conditions for mutual trust, resulting in an open community and a rich, frank exchange of ideas. And I think that a rich, frank exchange of ideas is just what is needed to help discern the preferred moral response to the refugee crisis. Because as you well know, opinion, opinions differ widely as to what morality requires in this situation. It's a very wide spectrum, and I'll mention too that I look at as sort of being on uh, each end, either end of the spectrum. Garrett Hardin argues that wealthy nations are like lifeboats. They have a limited capacity, uh, and that welcoming too many people uh, could sink the boat. Joseph Karens, on the other hand, asserts that borders themselves are a monument to global inequality. He argues, I think this is very provocative, that citizens in a rich Western democracy, citizenship, is the modern equivalent of a feudal class privilege. Uh, it's an inherited status that greatly enhances your uh, life's chances. And just like we don't pay much attention anymore to feudal birthright privileges, uh, Karens argues that we should be similarly skeptical about citizenship itself uh, in a rich European country. So these moral cho choices are tough in themselves, but added to the uh, situation is that they appear in the middle of very complicated political and social situations. There are many examples. In June, of course, Great Britain voted to withdraw from the European Union. Uh, many say in part that was motivated by fears of unchecked immigration. Just last night, I went to a very interesting program put on by the uh, WNL Center for International Education as part of its Borders Colloquium, and the panel was Brexit, Brexit and the Crisis of Democracy in Europe. You probably read in the last week or so that France has been struggling with the issues associated with dismantling the jungle, which was is the large refugee camp at Calais where people have piled up for years uh, hoping to make it into Great Britain. And that refugee camp has been seen as a symbol of Europe's failed efforts to handle the crisis. Well, Germany presents the most complex scenario due to its leadership role in responding to the flood of refugees. In fact, Germany's generous asylum policy, which is embedded in its constitution as a reaction to Nazi atrocities, has been a gravitational force uh, pulling refugees toward Germany. And by the end of 2015, I've seen the figure of 1.5 million refugees coming into Germany, many times more than any other European nation and approaching 2% of the German population. And this principal role in responding to the crisis has confronted Chancellor Merkel with various serious challenges, including security concerns and the rising popularity of Alternative for Germany, a right-wing populist party. So given Germany's central role, we are obviously very honored and privileged to have with us today our keynote speaker, Ambassador Peter Wittig, who is the German ambassador to the United States. Uh, prior to joining the German Foreign Service in 1982, Ambassador Wittig studied history, political science, and law, and law at a variety of universities, Bonn, Freiburg, Canterbury, and Oxford. Within the Foreign Service, he has held a number of important jobs, including ambassador to Cyprus, ambassador to uh, Lebanon, and German representative to the United Nations. He became a German ambassador to the United States in April 2014. And in that capacity, he has been an eloquent defender of Germany's generous refugee policy. Uh, I watched the September 2015 interview, Ambassador Wittig, uh, a view with Charlie Rose, which was very instructive. And the ambassador expressed great pride in Germany's humanitarian response. 
in what he called a crisis of historic, even epic proportions. The ambassador also acknowledged that this response was not a one-time thing, but instead it would be a generational task that would lead to a fundamental transformation of Germany and Europe. And we look forward to hearing Ambassador Wittig's present position, including whether or how he thinks the situation has changed uh, in the year uh, since that interview with Charlie Rose. Mr. Ambassador, we know that you're extraordinarily busy and we very much appreciate your taking the time from your schedule to spend with us here in Lexington. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Whitting. Dean Helwig, uh, Professor Kloon, faculty members, uh, students, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's um, so great to be here at this wonderful university in the most uh, wonderful weather you can imagine, standing here at this iconic podium I was told from 1868 of the time of Lee. So I'm very honored um, and flattered by your introduction, uh, Professor Kaloon, uh, and indeed the topic that was chosen for today um, has gripped us all and, and sparked really strong emotions over the past month. And before I make uh, my remarks, uh, I wanna acknowledge um, two very old and good friends, um, Susie and Wayne Thompson. Uh, our friendship goes back um, to 1980 when we spent the time together at the Freiburg University and it was a great additional reason to come here to Washington uh, and Lee University. Refugee crisis, wave of migration, biggest challenge since World War II. These were the headlines splashed across the front pages of newspapers around the world describing uh, these recent events. Uh, the German finance minister, uh, a person called Wolfgang Schäuble, was quite uncharacteristically somewhat more poetic. He called the influx of refugees in 2015 a rendezvous with globalization. Many Germans would probably like to add, yes, a rendezvous uh, that was more intense and maybe less amorous and somewhat more unexpected than the usual blind date. Ladies and gentlemen, Germany um, has always been a major beneficiary of globalization, with its far-reaching connections to Europe and its strong economic ties to the world. So it was indeed um, quite a different experience for many Germans in the summer of 2015 when unprecedented numbers of refugees streamed into Europe. We had not seen such a vast wave of people on the move since the Second World War. And we were, to be honest with you, quite overwhelmed. Most of you know what followed. Germany took in the bulk of all the refugees that have come to Europe thus far. Overall, we accepted around one million refugees in 2015 alone, most of them from Syria, some of them from Iraq and from Afghanistan, and also a significant number of, from countries um, uh, in other parts of the world. Since then, we have witnessed unprecedented support and engagement by the German people. At least 60,000 volunteers were and still are involved in helping to process, as they call it, and settle refugees. Students, retirees, businessmen teach German, uh, hand out clothing to the newly arrived, sometimes even cook food. Even my eldest son, who's now 18, in, in the midst of his adolescence, a, a phase in life that's usually not um, given to altruistic uh, feelings, uh, has established an organization here in the US to raise money for the refugees. A British colleague um, told me recently that we are, we the Germans are the only country in the world that could have managed the logistics for so many people in such a short period of time. I'm not so sure whether he's right, quite frankly, uh, because we have also seen some major organizational uh, setbacks in that process. 
But the management of the refugee influx was certainly a tour de force. You will hear many people in Europe saying that this was a wrong, this was a mistake, that it was rushed and irrational to let in all these strangers. And they criticized Germany and other countries uh, that they did so. I am, as a representative of my country, and well, as, as well as in my personal capacity, proud of what we did. We had for a very long time ignored the first signs of the crisis. People had paid criminal traffickers, human traffickers, had boarded unsafe, flimsy vessels, and had drowned on their dangerous way crossing the Mediterranean for many years. We did not intervene. Then, in the summer of 2015, we had long lines of people uh, sweating in the sweltering heat in Hungary and in Greece, stuck in a no man's land at the border, left without sufficient food or water. A human catastrophe that was, was on the brink of occurring. Germany, as well as some other countries in the European Union, did the only thing, in my opinion, that was right. We opened our borders. We helped. It was an affirmation of our belief in a free and liberal Europe, a Europe dedicated to human rights and a Europe that gives protection to those in need. However, the summer of 2015 also revealed an undeniable fact. Despite people's enormous engagement and enthusiasm, despite the initial throngs of people ready to welcome the refugees arriving at train stations in Munich and other cities, Germany's resources and the stamina of its people are not infinite. Another similar influx in 2016 would have overwhelmed our capacities, but also the willingness of the people to absorb those refugees. It simply would not have been possible. So we needed to reduce the numbers of refugees coming to Europe. There's also no denying a sizable minority segment of our population that goes, and that goes for most European countries, is opposed to the intake of refugees or of more refugees. Think of, for example, the National Front, Front National in France or other rather xenophobic parties. And we have seen the rise of an anti-immigration party in Germany too. It is a protest party that has gained astonishing strength in some regional elections. Their supporters are not neo-Nazis, but people driven by fear. Fear of too much change, fear of globalization, fear of loss of jobs to the refugees, fear of a loss of identity in their region and in their country. There's one interesting fact. Opposition to immigration is strongest in regions where there are few or, no, or hardly any refugees. We must not give up on those people, uh, but we have to try our best to soothe their fears and bring them back into the political mainstream. Ladies and gentlemen, there were and are growing voices in Europe, but also here in the United States, who claim that a return to the isolation of the nation state will solve the refugee crisis. They assert that only by doing so, we can reduce the numbers and the impact of the refugee flows to Europe and the United States. They believe that their countries can reap global benefits while shutting out global problems or fobbing them off to other countries. You can probably guess my reply to those voices. I disagree. The refugee crisis is both a European and a global challenge. As such, it can only be solved if Europe stands together and if we stand together with our international partners, especially the United States. What needs to be done on a European level? To start with, 
the European asylum system was not prepared for this influx. It is in need to, to reform. In 2015, the EU member states received a total of 1.3 million asylum claims distributed among all the states of the European Union. This is a manageable number. However, more than 60% of those people and of these claims were requested in just three countries, Germany, Sweden, and Hungary. We need to make sure that instead, every country in the European Union takes its share. Its share. We need to work harder and push more for a fair burden sharing within the European Union. In other areas, we have taken initial promising steps, but will need to increase our cooperation. We've already stepped up our collaboration with the transit countries. A central part of the EU's efforts has been a refugee agreement with Turkey. Turkey is the gateway uh, from Syria, the main original origin of the refugee flow to Europe. <clears throat> so Turkey is a key element in bringing down the numbers. This agreement has worked remarkably well and brought down rather dramatically the numbers of refugees coming to Europe and arriving in Europe. The EU is also now playing a crucial role in Africa, the second biggest transit route for refugees. It has established a close cooperation on migration issues, for example, with Niger, a country through which 90% of all refugees come that board boats in Libya. The European Border Protection Agency, called Frontex, has been completely reformed in the past year, and it can now help to protect the EU's borders much more effectively with more resources, more officers, and more authority. Ladies and gentlemen, the current refugee crisis is, however, more than a European challenge. It is an international one. We need to face it in, in an international and, in particular, a transatlantic approach. The stream of refugees we are currently witnessing will not end if we do not find a solution to the conflicts in the Middle East, above all in Syria. The international community raised $11 billion in humanitarian aid for Syrian refugees who, for example, have found temporary refuge in the vicinity, especially in Jordan and Lebanon. My own country, Germany, has pledged 2.5 billion at a recent conference. We are also working on further innovative mechanisms to improve the situation of refugees in the region because we want them to stay there. It's so much easier to return once the conflict in Syria has ended when they um, take refuge in the vicinity. And uh, we um, support the refugees there in particular. One example is Jordan. We are making it easier for Jordanian companies to sell their goods in the European markets. At the same time, the Jordanians are making it easier for the refugees to work in Jordan. By this, we stabilize the situation in the host country and help the refugees in their struggle to establish a new life. Germany and the United States have also worked side by side on a diplomatic solution for Syria. Of course, the US was in the lead, but we tried to support the efforts of the administration. The war and instability in Syria, but also Iraq, is the root cause of the refugee crisis. We have to tackle it. We will continue to strive for cessation of hostilities in the country. But let me be honest with you, we're still a long way off and the situation in Syria, in Syria currently does not give us reason to hope for a quick solution. Let me also broaden the scope a bit. Globally, 
more than 65 million people are fleeing violence, political persecution, or poverty on a global scale. We are experiencing large movements of people from Central America, Africa, and the whole of Asia. So in an increasingly globalized mobile, and thanks to the internet and the smartphones, informed world, the numbers will most likely increase. Uh, I remind you that this flow of immigration is the first digital immigration in history. People know that there is a way out of their predicament, be it a fragile state, a civil war, or just a poor country. They can see it where the route is to a better world on their smartphone. And that's a first. That is a, a new historical development. We will, need, um, we will need to make sure that migration, its causes and its management are addressed in concert, internationally. That includes coordinated and increased efforts in crisis management, humanitarian assistance, and development aid. And it also includes burden sharing when it comes to providing refuge to those in need. Ladies and gentlemen, in international discussions, one aspect is often forgotten, both the importance and the challenges of integration. Despite all our efforts, all the money we spend, and all the stabilization plans we try to implement, refugees and migrants are a fact of the 21st century. They are a fact of the globalized world a rendezvous with globalization, as I quoted earlier. We will therefore need to find ways to integrate immigrants more quickly and effectively into our societies. My country has welcomed immigrants from southern Europe, from especially from Turkey and many other regions since the early 1950s. When I grew up in the 60s and 70s, though, Germany was a seemingly homogeneous nation. All my fellow students at university had German parents and had grown up in this country. This has changed. Not only our 2014 Soccer World Cup winners, but increasingly all our university students, politicians, and intellectuals have various ethnic backgrounds. Today's Germany is arguably one of the most diverse country in Europe. More than one-fifth of all Germans have an immigration background. Germany has gained a lot from these immigrants and is proud of its diversity. And by the way, Germany is also an aging country, so we need immigration. Of course, we are miles away from being the American melting pot, where a glance at the list of Nobel laureates or Oscar award winners or just a stroll around Silicon Valley reveals what an important role immigrants play in American society and how successful American integration has worked. We believe three things are essential for successful integration. Those are the lessons learned we drew from the previous wave of, of immigration in the 50s and 60s that I talked about. First, offer the refugees language training. Language skills are key, are essential to finding work and to, to integrate in, into the community. And this year alone, 550,000 refugees will be um, offered language courses and language training in Germany and the government hired an extra 32,000 language teacher, teachers for that purpose, quite, quite an effort. Second, get them to the labor market as quickly as possible. Offer them opportunities to vocational training and that also means liberalizing to an extent the labor market. And third, bridge the cultural gap. We also offer now integration courses so-called integration courses, teaching them about the principle of our constitutional order and our values. And that is not something that is self-evident. 
You know that most of our refugees and immigrants coming to Germany come from a Muslim uh, background. So uh, there is an issue here uh, about the co compatibility of their values. Think about gender between their world, where they are coming from, for instance in Afghanistan, and our Western liberal democracy. So that is an issue that cannot just brush, be brushed away. It is an important uh, integration issue that we have to deal with. Ladies and gentlemen, the US, but also the German experience, shows how much a country stands to gain from successful immigration and integration. It also shows that integration is not an easy and straightforward process. It shows that an integration requires sustained, concerted efforts, a generational effort, as you quoted me. Cooperation and dialogue among those countries that are or may become possible destination of migrants can be very fruitful. What is successful integration? Which strategies work? What does not work? These are questions that can be answered best together. We can learn from each other. And I assure you, I believe we can learn a lot from the US experience that you have with immigration and integration. That is why it is so important, especially for young students and scholars, to go out and live abroad, meet peers and, uh, from other countries with different backgrounds, discuss and exchange views. And this is why I'm, again, very happy to be here with many students sitting in the auditorium and the chance, hopefully, to discuss with you after my remarks. And to have in the end at least a small rendezvous with globalization, with globalization together with you. And I thank you for your patience. The ambassador has kindly agreed to a brief Q&A session. So I'm going to turn it back over to him and he will recognize people. We have uh, someone here with a mic. So if you're recognized, uh, wait for the mic and please stand and direct your question directly to the ambassador. Please. Um, yes, sir. Um, this problem, where was Germany at the root of the situation? We saw this serious uh, crisis come for many years. What were we doing then? It just reminds me of closing the barn door after the horses have gotten out. Where were we in the beginning of this root situation? I really didn't understand your question very well. I think I have an acoustic. Uh... Her question was, where was Germany uh, at the root of the situation that we foresaw the problem developing in Syria? And um, I guess the question is, why was not, why was more not done earlier? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Where the um, war in Syria um, developed slowly from sort of a freedom movement into a fully fledged civil war. So it evolved over time from 2011 to uh, 2015. Um, we had not um, experienced that certain surge of numbers coming into Europe. They came sort of in a trickle. Um, they came from Northern Africa before that through Italy, and, uh, but in a, steady, in a steady flow. So I would say in hindsight, we didn't read the signs of the time very well. Uh, we thought, yes, people are coming to us, but we never expected this sudden surge and this sudden wave. In hindsight, it was probably a mistake not to prepare earlier. But, you know, after the event, you're always wiser. And, and I think many people in Germany, also the politicians, are being self-critical that we, 
didn't prepare better for that wave, but it was hard to predict. And all of a sudden, um, a, a, a sort of a number of factors um, came together. Uh, the situation in Syria had become untenable. Um, there was a full-fledged war going on there. Um, the situation in Iraq became unstable. Afghanistan was again um, witnessing uh, increased fighting. And so people were on the move and that encouraged other people. They saw it on their iPhone. As I said, this is a digital immigration. People for the first time in, in, in history, if you will, even know that there is a way out of their predicament. They see it in the most remote village in Afghanistan. They see it on their smartphone and they are being wooed into by, uh, in some cases, by cruel human traffickers. And they pay thousands of dollars and there are promises um, being made to, 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 to come to Europe and, and they pay their money, uh, their, their, their last penny to do that. Now, we've got to distinguish here, and that's a, an important distinction, between refugees in the sense of people politically persecuted or fleeing a war and a civil war. That's one category. And the other category is sort of economic migrants. And it's very important to distinguish those categories. We give asylum only to those who we consider refugees. The others that come for, you know, understandable economic motives, we, we can't take them in. We have, we have to eventually repatriate many of those because we cannot offer labor opportunities for everybody in the world who wants to come. So th that is a, a, an important distinction to draw here. We uh, are willing to give refuge to those people who qualify as a refuge, a refugee in the narrow sense, whereas with economic migrants, at this point in time, uh, as, as, as much as we understand and respect their motives, we, we will have to repatriate many of them. I see uh, a gentleman in, in the back of the uh, middle segment of, of the rows. I understand that uh, Germany has several million Turks that have been there now up to 50 years. My question is, how well integrated are they? Do they consider themselves Germans or do they consider themselves Turks at this point? That's a good question. That was our first lesson of immigration. And it was, they were not refugees, if you will. They were not persecuted, but they came to Germany in the search for jobs. We had in the 50s and 60s what we call uh, the economic miracle. The economy was, was booming and so we were short of uh, labor. And so they came and most of them, we call them guest workers. Um, I think most of them thought they would return and, and we thought they would stay in a, maybe five years and then go, go back home. But they stayed. and. Uh, a lot of them, I don't know the exact percentage, now are German citizens. What we learn from that experience is, because we thought they will return after a while, we didn't make an effort to entice them to learn the language. Uh, so especially uh, people coming from rural areas, and especially the women, uh, they um, didn't learn the German language. So you, 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 um, we'll meet people today in, in Berlin, for instance, where there are Turkish women who have been in Germany for 40 years or something, but don't speak a word of German uh, because there was no incentive. That's a lesson we draw now for today. In order to integrate people who will probably stay with us, you have to incentivize them to learn German Otherwise, they, they, they can't integrate in, into the labor market. So how good are the Turks integrated? I would say it is all in all a success story. One of the reasons is, yes, they are um, Muslims, but of a very moderate variant of, of um, Islam. 
uh, Turkey is a neighboring country of, of the European Union, is part Europe, part Asia, um, so there is not such a huge cultural gap. They are very entrepreneurial, they are hardworking people, they want to they're also conservative in a, in, a, in a family kind of way. They, uh, they, are, um, they, they, are, they, are, they are very hardworking. Uh, so uh, I would say now the first and second generation or the second and third generation of those Turks that came early on, uh, they are fully integrated. And you now see uh, quite a few of members of parliament, of uh, successful business people, of the academic elite that are of Turkish origin. And we changed our law and in order to help the integration of Turks, we allowed them to have a, a double nationality. They can be Turks and Germans at the same time. In order to avoid that sort of binary choice, uh, and, and that has been, I think, a good measure. Oh, I see a couple of hands there. Yes. Uh, what has Germany's experience been and what practices and procedures has it developed to deal with the security issues protecting against granting access to terrorists and criminals? Yeah, that is, uh, I know, a concern of many people. Um, and uh, it's a legitimate concern. Um, at the height of the refugee crisis, uh, we were uh, overwhelmed uh, with, with the influx. And uh, mind you, in, in October, November last year, uh, we had 10,000 people a day arriving uh, in, in Germany. So it was very difficult to, as they say, process them, vet them, and uh, so sort of scan their uh, their papers, etc., and 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 examine their uh, their background. This has been done incrementally afterwards, and especially since the numbers are are down. I think our authorities now feel pretty confident that most of those people that are have been coming last year are now properly registered. You cannot exclude a security issue here. Um, we had, uh, a couple of months ago, we had our share of terrorist attacks. In, in, in one week, we had four uh, terrorist attacks. Um, but the link to the refugees um, was uh, not, not very strong. It was in, in two cases out of those five, there were refugees, uh, the apparent pe perpetrators, but they had been refugees of a longer standing. Um, so if, if terrorists want to strike uh, in Germany, they will probably find different ways than taking the tortures route of a couple of months through Turkey and Greece and, and the Balkan route. Um, but it is, of course, a security issue, and, and that's why our um, security authorities, our secret services are as vigilant as, as they can. Uh, you, you cannot exclude uh, any uh, evil doers uh, among that group, um, but I would uh, not not say that there is a relationship, uh, a strongly uh, fact-based relationship between the refugees and and, and terrorists. It's, it's, it has be, been uh, you know a very 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 rare exception. Try to take a few student questions. This sure. Student, way back there, right there. Yes. That was a wise move. Thank you. <laughs> Given the sheer number of people that have been crossing the border, how realistic is a peaceful resolution of the refugee crisis? I had, had a problem acoustically again. Could you? Uh, I said, how realistic is a peaceful resolution to the refugee crisis? Do you mean um, the the root conflict in Syria? Is is that what you mean by peaceful or the refugee? I mean the, the refugee uh, crisis as such is not a not a not a war, right? But it is. I mean it, it has been peaceful, but it has. Been
been full of problems, but it has been peaceful. So I'm asking, are you referring to some of the root causes of the wars in, in, in the Middle East, or, or what, what are you, do you have in mind? I, I'm more referring to just the, the sheer number of people that have been crossing borders and, and just how much change that's been going on is, is likely to cause, of course, a, a bit of disruption and a bit of anxiety. And I'm wondering, I, I guess, more to the point, uh, whether or not you think that many of these changes are setting off chain reactions that might lead to greater conflict in Europe. Yeah. You, you see, um, the refugee crisis is also um, based on our uh, geography. Europe is a pretty stable continent. You know, the European Union has been a huge success story in eradicating war and conflict, bringing s prosperity to Europe. So it has been a very stable uh, part of the world. But we're surrounded by fundamentally unstable regions. Uh, the first is the Middle East. It's basically in turmoil. And we are neighboring uh, continent to the Middle East. They can, they, they can come. And, and the other unstable region recently is North Africa. So that's also a neighboring region. America is blessed by geography. Uh, you have two oceans and you have two neighbors. One is uh, very friendly, two are friendly, but one is totally without problems, Canada, and you have your own issues with um, immigration coming from Mexico, but otherwise you're really well protected. The, the situation is different in my country. We are surrounded by nine neighbors. So um, we are neighbors of two fundamentally unstable regions, the Middle East and North Africa. So can you shut yourself off? Um, I don't think so. Um, they will find a way to come even if you try to close the borders. We cannot build walls here. That's not a recipe that we can follow, quite frankly. Um, so it is a part of the geography that, that we are living in. But also, I think we have to see that in the 21st century, uh, migration is part of what is coming. And, and, and we've got to be, to your question before, we've got to be better prepared for that. It doesn't mean when, that we've got to take them all in, but we've got to be mindful of the root causes, and the root causes are usually wars or fragility in states, sometimes it's poverty. This is where we have to look look for. And unfortunately, uh, this is happening around Europe. And uh, th those people, small wonder, are migrating or are fleeing to the zone of prosperity. And that is us. Uh, if, if they were in your neighborhood, they would come all to the United States, be, be, be assured. But the ge geography works otherwise. Here. Um, hi. So I've heard that a lot of the uh, refugees coming over from Syria are like very well educated um, and usually even rich, um, but they are fleeing because there's ob obvious instability. Um, I'm just wondering if Germany is actively trying to place these people in the jobs that they're qualified for in their home country, or if one of the stipulations of being a refugee is that you sort of have to settle for a job that's like maybe below what you're qualified for? Mm. Well, I think uh, that the refugees from Syria are mostly rich. I think that, that that's not uh, standing up to the facts. I mean, uh, most of them are really poor or have lost everything. Uh, Syrians, and I've served in the region, I was ambassador to Lebanon, and I know also Syria very well, which is a neighboring country to Lebanon. I was in Syria many, many times. Uh, it's a um, it's a country of very talented uh, people. Uh, they 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 learn languages fast. They're good business people. Um, but uh, most of those refugees are poor. Uh, they lost everything. They've been bombed. They they lost their homes. So some of them might have um, some 
reserves, financial reserves, but, but most of them are, are pretty poor. The qualification level varies enormously, and of course those who are, bring skills uh, have less trouble to find jobs and less trouble to integrate. You know, in the ideal world, we would love to have only skilled, um, excellently qualified, and multi-linguistic uh, uh, people, but is, this is not um, the situation of refugees uh, that are fleeing a war. Um, the prospects for bringing them into the labor market are mixed. Um, we will we harbor no illusion. It will, will take time. Um, also, we have a very elaborate social system and network. We have a minimum wage. Um, it, it's very hard to uh, tell the unions in our country, but we give work to the refugees for half of the minimum wage. You can imagine that doesn't go down well. Um, on the other hand, we have to liberalize our labor market because you cannot employ uh, newcomers, uh, refugees, with the wages that German uh, skilled workers, for instance, earn that is not realistic. So you have to be flexible here. This is the key, language and early integration into the labor market. And this is what we try to do. It's, 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 not, um, it's not easy. And of course, the employers have to play along and we have to create opportunities for them. Uh, but I assure you, most of them uh, have are coming without a university diploma and without um, many uh, language skills. Please, the lady. Uh, thank you for speaking with us. So I guess my question is, Angela Merkel has um, surprised a lot of people by how many people she's been willing to take into Germany. Why do you think that she made that decision given that it was largely unpopular um, in certain areas of Germany? Um, and what, what's, your, what's your take on that? Yeah, she took that decision uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a pivotal moment uh, in end of September, beginning of Octo October last year. And basically it was a, a moment of a humanitarian crisis that threatened to get out of hand. Uh, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands were assembling in Greece and, and, and in Hungary, in the Balkan countries. And uh, they were all poised to go to Germany. And had we closed our borders at the time, or had we deported people who, who had come to our country, for, let's say, via Greece, um, I think that would not have been sustainable. I think politically and morally, we, we, we couldn't have upheld such a position. The world would have, you know, would have, would have given out a hammering, would have said, how inhumane are you as a prosperous um, country of 80 millions? Are, are you... Are you uh, that cold-hearted that you can just send them back to Greece, to that relatively poorer country. Um, so, w would that have would that have been an option for the Chancellor to say they all got to go back to Greece? It would not have been an option, I believe, and it would not have been in line with our values. And there's one thing important to note. You know, uh, Germany in the Nazi time produced many refugees, many the Nazis expelled many people. All the Jews had to leave or, or were expelled, and they found refuge in other countries. So one of the lessons that the fathers of, and mothers of our constitution after the Second World War drew is to formulate an asylum law that's probably the most liberal welcoming asylum law in Europe. In our constitution it says the asylum is a human right. So, and also our judiciary is very generous in granting or upholding um, the asylum because of that historical experience. So I think we owed it 
and to those refugees to stand up to our humanitarian standards. But you were right, the, the chancellor was criticized for that and she lost support. And, uh, and, and there is, as I said before, this anti-immigration party, which is, I think, a natural phenomenon. Uh, not all people are clapping. I mean, people are, are fearing for our you know, cohesion, are, are fearing, they think it's strange that we have now a, a number of, of Muslims in our countries. They, 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 they fear for their jobs, they, they fear for the identity, that's everything that's very understandable. That's why I say I, I don't want to stigmatize those people who are against. I, I want to understand them I, and I think our political leaders have to, uh, have to bring them in, have to reach out to them and, and, and bring them into the mainstream again. This has upended in a not small way the political landscape of the whole of Europe. You have right-wing parties now, big way. In France, you have them in, in the Netherlands, in some smaller northern, very, very liberal, traditional liberal countries like Denmark, etc. And we have this one, not, not dramatically big, but this one protest party of, of, of the right in, in our country. And that is one of those after shocks, after effects of that wave. Uh, and, and I think we are again here into a longer haul. You know, the positive scenario would be if we manage to end the civil war in Syria, if that situation stabilizes, if Iraq doesn't become more unstable as it is today, if we can uh, convince the Afghans not to leave their country, then some of them might return. Uh, and I think a lot of Syrians will want to return, a lot of refugees. If, however, this war lasts for another 10 years, the likelihood that they return is smaller because then they have, would have sent their kids to school, uh, the first or the second generation uh, will be, you know, feeling partially at home in Germany. So the likelihood of return is, is smaller. So the earlier we can end those conflicts in the Middle East, the better are the chances that most of them, or at least a big segment of them, will go back to their home country. Are we, do we have a time limit here? Yes, of course, of course. No, I'm, I'm good, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> Earlier you said the United States was a mo um, the, the iteration of immigrants in the United States was a good model. Given the current um, political atmosphere with the United States election, do you still believe that America can continue to serve as a good model, or has this current atmosphere challenged your belief in that? Mm. Well, I, I don't want to, especially four days before the elections, in, in, uh, intrude, you know, step on that thin ice. Um, this is not my, my job, so I will refrain uh, from a comment here on, on the current uh, debate on immigration. So let's, you know, interpret my remarks um, uh, in, in, in basically uh, applauding the, the American efforts, what it has dan done in the past with immigration. And I think, you know, this is a country of immigrants, as, as everybody says all the time. And I think it, it, it is a wonderful success story. Uh, there's, there's this statistic about the Fortune 500 uh, companies and how many of those CEOs, I think 40%, are have an immigration background. You know, that's a wonderful success story, how you can be successful in this country within sometimes only two generations. And, and I think that, that is something, uh, there is a lot to learn also in the very practical um, measures that you take from the United States. Uh, uh, the, the welcoming culture, uh, the, the legal situation, uh, and, 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 and the spirit of giving people a chance uh, and and also the uh, the inclusiveness, the the spirit of inclusiveness that that is uh, you know the rule here in the United States. Uh, you, you can build on a great tradition of including 
immigrants. And we had to learn this, uh, you know, in a, in a very short time. We, uh, as, as I said, when I was a student, we, I, I didn't even know anybody who, 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 who was an immigrant. In, in my student, there was nobody. And, and, and we were a very homogeneous uh, country. And now we have 20% of our population with an immigration background. So that, that is a, a tremendous development. And as I said also, we need immigration. We are an aging society. We are, we are a, a country of 82 million. And we, we can absorb a million. We, we, we can, it's just the speed and the number uh, have overwhelmed us. But it, it's not an issue that we cannot absorb a million uh, immigrants. It's, it's, it's the way we do it, and it's a cultural challenge, and this is what I indicated, it, it's not that easy. I think, um, and, and again, this should not be construed as a, as a, as a comment, but um, most of the so-called illegal immigrants in this country, if I understand correctly, are from, uh, from the hemisphere, from, from Latin America, from Mexico, from Central America. Now, those are not people from an entirely extraneous culture. Most of them are Christians, are Catholics, uh, are family-oriented, are, uh, you know, are not totally from, a, from another planet. Um, in our case, um, let's say, taking in Shia from Iraq or Sunni from Syria is, is potentially a much bigger challenge in terms of values, in terms of tolerance, of religion. You know, we've got to tell those immigrants, and that's why we give them immigration courses. Those are our values. This is what we expect you to respect in terms of gender equality. We have, uh, in our criminal law, um, a paragraph on Holocaust denial. That's a crime in, in, in our country. So uh, we have a special relationship to Israel. And if you uh, vilify uh, Israel, that you, you, you might get you into legal uh, trouble. So we've got to make sure that this, those are our values that we expect them to, um, uh, to respect. So I guess we have the bigger challenge than immigration or immigration from uh, f from uh, Latin American countries. The gentleman with a green tie. A nice, nice tie, by the way. Um, Well, that's not entirely correct. I mean, she is the head of a totally unimaginable, unimaginable in this country, a head of a so-called grand coalition. Center left and center right are forming a coalition government. Uh, so um, that is about 60% of uh, the support in parliament, uh, even more. Um, it is it is even more. Um, so the whole of government was behind everything that she decided. Uh, and uh, it was not a lonely decision. Of course, she's the boss um, of the government, so she, in the end, uh, was responsible. Um, but the whole gov government stood behind her. And I would say, at the time, most of really most of the German people endorsed her, endorsed her policy. It was only later when the daily problems arose, like, for instance, housing refugees in the gym of a school. And uh, after six weeks, the parents would say, you know, when can our kids use the gym again? for sports, or for physical education. You know, when those day-to-day -day questions 
uh, concern you, then uh, sort of the, the enthusiasm is waning, of course. But at the beginning, I think the, 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 the principal decision not to build a wall, not to turn them back, uh, but to uh, grant asylum to those who are in need and are refugees in the sense that I explained, that was endorsed by the majority of the people and certainly the majority of the political forces in Germany. Well, I'm going to ask the ambassador to stay up here a moment. I have to step back here. I have a small gift of appreciation for him. <laughs> This is a walking stick that graduates of the law school traditionally acquire. So we thought it would be appropriate to give one of these to the ambassador. It's engraved with his name, and we hope he will look back and find uh, remembrance of his time here in Lexington. So thank you very well, much. Well, this is a wonderful gift. I'm a honor. So it's no weapon, I, I guess. <laughs> I, uh, I thank uh, the university for this invitation. It was a real pleasure meeting you. Thank you for your interesting questions. Thank you.